I've 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 passed from just mere pimping to total whoredom, he says. Yeah, I saw that. All right, um, let's start in about uh, 30 seconds. Whenever. You, you got your cup of coffee there? I already have my cup of coffee. All right, you're in Chicago? I'm in, the, I'm in Chicago, the great city. It's your hometown, eh? It's my hometown, but you know, it's, I'll tell you something. It is actually the most beautiful downtown in the world. It makes, it's, 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 it's the best of any of them. It's just gorgeous. At night, it's just great. I haven't been in the millennium either. Right. Is that nice? All right, let's um, let's get going. Three, two, one. Uh, this is David Barsamian, and I'm pleased to welcome Seymour Hirsch, author of the new book Chain of Command: The Road from 9/11 to Abu Ghraib. Seymour Hirsch is a multiple Pulitzer Prize, George Polk Award winner. Uh, he's a regular feature writer for The New Yorker. Welcome to the program, Seymour Hirsch. Glad to be here. Well, actually, I want to start with something that is a constant refrain of the uh, Bush presidential campaign, and that is, Kerry saw the same intelligence as I did. Is that credible? Uh, Probably. Actually, the truth is that um, there was intelligence, all the agencies. Look, the the truth is, uh, the fact is that, uh, like it or not like it, uh, George Bush did not lie. Um, um, uh, he didn't go and, you know, he, he, he believed the intelligence he had and, um, he didn't go into, uh, Iraq, uh, in my view, uh, because of Israel or because of oil. He went there because he really believes, uh, he and a gang of neoconservatives in the White House and in the Pentagon, they believe that bringing democracy to the Middle East was the most important thing in the world to do. And so, um, they go to the the idea was, and they also thought they could do it, as we all know. Maybe we don't, but they thought they could go there. the The plan was they thought they could go. There were ten or fifteen thousand troops, a little some special forces, a few bombs, and a, a lot of American flags. Lay it down, and uh, uh, um, uh, Saddam Hussein would leave. A new government would be formed, and democracy would flow like uh, you know, like I've been saying, like water out of uh, fountains uh, throughout the Middle East, Iran, uh, Syria, Lebanon. That's what they believed, and what's scary is that they still believe it, despite the fact they're completely wrong. And all of every evidence shows that it's it's not working and it's not going to work. But sure, they had intelligence that Saddam uh, had nukes. Everybody had that same intelligence. Uh, that was wrong too. Well, does Kerry see the PDB, the Presidential Daily Brief? No, no, absolutely not. But they, I don't think there's any, I, you know. My belief is that Kerry, uh, the senators certainly get access to intelligence, and the intelligence across the board was that we think he has WMD. There were people inside the uh, CIA and particularly inside the State Department, who, who uh, INR, the, the State Department Intelligence Branch, who disagreed. But the general uh, assessments that were made and presented to the Congress and that Kerry as a ranking member certainly had access to would be that there was WMD there. You know, Kerry says, he has said publicly, that if he, even if he'd um, known that there was no WMD before the, uh, the, uh, the Senate vote that gave uh, uh, Bush the, uh, the formal authority to go in October of uh, uh, 2002, the, you know, the vote, the, uh, the, the major vote the Senate did, the resolution, he said even if there was no WMD, uh, he'd known that he would have voted for it. And, of course, the answer is, Hey, Senator, if there was no WMD, there wouldn't have been a vote. What are you going to go to war for? Um, but I, uh, in terms of delusion, I don't think you can separate, you know, or, or, or having access to bad intelligence. You can't separate the, anybody in this one. Across the board, the intelligence stunk. Well, there was a PDB, a presidential daily brief, uh, on August 6, 2001, entitled Bin Laden Determined to strike in U.S. The president was at his ranch in Crawford, Texas at the time. What action uh, was taken by the Bush administration on receipt of that information? Well, we all know from, the, from Richard Clark's testimony that none. There was no, you know, they didn't respond to it. But, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, to be honest, I, 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 I don't think as, 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 as much as I am frightened by Bush, uh, particularly since I think he's a believer, and you understand there's nothing worse than, a, than an idealistic or, uh, or utopian uh, or Trotskyite, you know, somebody who believes in permanent revolution. That's what these guys are. 
these guys believe that the only way to go is to continue what they're doing. If Bush is reelected, he's going to bomb more. It's going to be it's going to be really hell to pay. But I, I think to say that you can blame even Bush or anybody for not doing more, I don't think anybody could anticipate 9/11. I'm sorry to say that I don't think there's any way you could anticipate it. Common sense just would not let you do it. It was just too too striking. There's a, a group of people here in Boulder, and, and you find them around the country, actually, who uh, believe that uh, the Bush administration, if they did n- were not involved in organizing 9-11, at least let it happen. They point to the fact that they say that interceptors were not scrambled. Is there any credibility to that, to those kinds of theories? No, I'll tell you why. Um, uh, uh. I, uh, just in personal terms, I've been writing an alternative history of the war, of the of the war on terror since 9/11. Obviously, I've been dealing with people in high positions in the in the, in the intelligence community, and uh, beginning in in the late 2001, I was raising a lot of questions in, in the New Yorker magazine. You know, pretty much ignored in the beginning, for sure. But um, I can tell you that, um, to in order to carry out um, suppress. Um, um, the, the, the conspiracy involved in doing something like that would be more than a few people. You just couldn't get away with it. And I'm just on a practical level. And on the other level is um, it, it's a non-starter um, without some empirical evidence. You end up end up you're going to end up debating whether or not Oswald shot Kennedy. You know, or was he a lone gunman? You know what I mean? There's just no way to go. There's no empirical evidence. All the people I've talked with on the inside who are extremely, talking about senior officers and senior guys in the intelligence community, seriously troubled by the Bush administration, seriously troubled by the war, seriously think that this man is um, um, uh, one of the worst presidents we've ever had and very frightening in, in, inside, inside the government, that none of these people are, have ever even suggested that there was any basis for believing that uh, this uh, was countenanced or acquiesced in by anybody. It's just beyond the pale. And so we might as well deal with the reality. The reality is that we're in a war we cannot win. Uh, we have two candidates. You know, both We have the president who says we must win, and we have a Democratic candidate who says that he's also going to win. And, you know, it, it's too bad because I can tell you right now there's no winning. This war is done. Are we in a win-win situation then? Yeah, we're in a lose-lose situation is what we are. And and, and um, I'm always amazed that um, it is sort of amusing that here we have a Democratic candidate, Mr. Kerry, who publicly says, look, we can win the war. I'm going to bring more troops, more special forces, more increase the army. I'm going to start training the Iraqis, these poor hapless Iraqis who join the armed forces and the police. I'm going to increase the training and I'm going to do something. I'm going to get tough with Iran. And then we have the President of the United States using the liberal word, calling him the L word. <laughs> That's not much of a liberal platform. Look, I'll take it. It's better than the other guys, but it, it is pretty funny. No, we can't. The, the, this is, I'm, look, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you the way I understand it from my friends, that we're on the verge of civil war. Then I'll tell you some signs. And, civil war in Iraq. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 if it's not civil war already, the insurgency is very strong, very coordinated. And I'll tell you something else, that since we've installed Alawi, this sort of hapless loser that we, the president is touting, um, Iyad Alawi, who was a, a member of the Iraqi secret intelligence service, the Makabara, before he uh, defected uh, 30 years ago from Saddam, one of Saddam's inside guys, no standing inside either the Sunni or the Shia community. He's just, in the use of Cold War terms, he's a puppet government. But since he took office June 28th, and here's a telling fact that really troubles me as, as a professor. Somebody worked for the New York Times for, you know, all during the 1970s. There's been an, um, an exponential increase in daily bombing rates. The number of sorties have gone up enormously. The number of bombing goes up. And some of the weapons we use have a kill. The bombs have a kill range of 400 meters. No reporting on it. No statistics. We're never told how many bombs are being dropped. Uh, all we do is we have bombing after bombing in Fallujah against suspected uh, um, uh, Al Qaeda or uh, uh, or uh, uh, Zakari terror targets, and you know we we've now gone into Fallujah 13 times or 14 times to kill suspected Zakari targets without any evidence we've ever hit anybody, except Al Jazeera shows you know workmen digging out uh, maimed and killed uh, 
Iraqi children the next day. And you wonder why the insurgency keeps on getting strong. Well, there seems to be an endless number of uh, so-called safe houses and, <laughs> and senior uh, Zarqawi and al-Qaeda operatives who are hit. Apparently, there are no junior um, operatives. They're always senior. Look, I'll take it a step further. Yeah. The intelligence community has really been troubled by what the White House has been saying about Zakari. First of all, it's not clear that Zakari is behind. We don't know. We, one of the problems we have, of course, and that's why you have a prison abuses like Abu Ghraib, it's one of the problems you have is we don't have any intelligence on the insurgency. From the very beginning of the war, we didn't realize there was going to be insurgency. And then when it began, um, we couldn't penetrate it. And in the, a year ago, there were two and three man cells operating against us. We now know that the insurgency is in the 10 or 15 man collectives. We still can't penetrate it. And so the guys on the inside have been telling me for months, Zakari, you know, Zakari is a Jordanian. He's not Al Qaeda. He has no connection with Al Qaeda. His, his real goal has been to destroy the Jordanian uh, royal family. Uh, he, there's no way he'd be trusted by the insurgency. The idea that he's in Fallujah, which is the heartbeat of the insurgency, and running as a senior leader is, a, is comical to people. They just, and, and the idea that everybody who has his head beheaded, um, the, the guy doing the cutting behind the mask of Zakari is not taken credible. Here's what some smart guys believe, if you want to know. Um, there's no jobs there. Part of the thing we did in Iraq was Bremer's job was not only uh, his main job was to do shock therapy to the economy. The Republican, the sort of neoconservative goal was to uh, privatize Iraq. Iraq had been a socialized country. Most of the big industry was socialized. We were going to privatize it. We were going to uh, break down all the businesses, uh, uh, no local employees, that we started bringing in people from Bangladesh and India to do the work, which is why I see, uh, so many people in Iraq are so angry at the foreign workers. There's no jobs there, and you wonder why people stand in line to, you know, to risk their lives to join the police or the uh, or the army, Iraqi police and army, uh, because there's no work. And everybody, every human being, every male wants to take care of his family, and they pay $228 a month for the army, uh, U.S. subsidized funds, and that's an enormous amount of money there. So they stand in line and risk their lives. That's why they keep on going. It's not because they're they be, they're hostile to. Uh, the insurgency are loyal to us, or Zakari, I mean, or uh, Alawi, the Alawi regime. And so you have this horrible situation. And what's going on in the last three months is the insurgency itself, the Ba'ath leadership, whatever, has begun killing its own people. They've begun murdering their own people, blowing them up because they want to keep people from joining the police and army. So they're blowing up these lines. And rather than take the blame for it, they started telling us, we suddenly getting walk-ins, liaison services and walk-ins, guys coming in for their $100 bill with intelligence, telling us about this guy, Zakari. It's very possible. And we bit, look, lying and sinker, Zakari, 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 is all the president says. It's very possible that these guys, in their wisdom, the insurgency, don't want to be blamed for killing their own people, put up Zakari as a front guy, knowing we'd go for it, and we've gone for it. So now we're blaming an outside agitator, for killings of the of Iraqi citizens, women and children that are being done by the insurgency, I mean, is that dumb or is that dumb? That's why we can't win. We can't win because we play chess and they play go. We're behind the curve. Is Iraq, in your view, looking uh, somewhat like uh, Algeria did to the French in the 1950s and early 1960s? Well, the analogy is pretty close, you know, and, and don't forget what happened even afterwards when there were legitimate elections in Algeria. What happened? You know, nobody recognized them. And with the help of the French, also, the, uh, the, the, uh, once the elections were held, if they didn't come out the right way, the French intervened and, to, uh, and started a civil war there for years to stop the Muslims. And one of the things, one of the ironies, you know, I guess, you know, um, one of the ironies of the whole war is, you know, these guys had this, this, as I said, utopian idea. They really believed they could bring democracy to the Middle East. And again, what makes them dangerous is they, it doesn't matter how many body bags come back. They believe it. That's why Bush is never going to stop. Um, but still, when one man, one vote, America was the bastion of democracy. And when, once we take, once the company, once uh, Saddam retreats, we now know that we didn't win the war. What happened is on the orders. Uh, I actually write about this in the book. Um, I, I interviewed some people with direct access to some amazing stuff about uh, how Saddam planned before the war. 
way before the war to break up it, to have his people break up into small units and, and he began he began parking weapons in caches around the country in 2001 anticipating this at some point you know an american invasion but nonetheless um the, the critical point is that once we did come in this the, the shiite population much um, but downtrodden, constantly attacked by Saddam. He wouldn't allow them to have religious freedom. They had every reason to support us. They they welcomed us. Many of them did. Sixty percent of the country, they, one man, one vote. There would be a vote, and the Shiites would take control. But what does Rumsfeld say very early after the uh, war begins? Well, we're not going to have an Islamic Republic here, he says. So, you know, uh, talk about walking on your own dong. You know what I mean? From the very beginning. We, we made it almost impossible for it to work. And if that's in that sense, it's like the Algerian model. Uh, you know, uh, w- once you get some freedom, you're not, and once you get a real election, you're not going to, if you don't like the result, you know, it happened in Pakistan in 1971 too. It's, it's not unknown in the world. The uh, Dulfa report, the CIA Iraq survey group uh, report came out, uh, 918 pages, uh, cost American taxpayers a billion dollars, uh, essentially saying that uh, WMD capability was deteriorating. Uh, Iraq produced no WMDs after 1991 and finished destroying them by 1996. Was there anything in that report uh, that caught your attention? Well, first of all, the report was totally accurate. I'll tell you what's interesting about it. To me, I know Charlie Dulfer, the guy that wrote the report, and the American press, it's all tabula risa with the uh, main, mainstream press for some reason. And I know if I were at the New York Times, I'd be writing, I'd be telling you who Dulfer was. Dulfer was the, 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 the senior American assigned to the UN inspection team, UNSCOM. And he was known inside the team as, for his closeness to Washington, and he was a back channel. And after 96, the story is, and I've written this in the New Yorker four or five years ago, long before the war, Bart Gelman of the Washington Post has written the same story uh, before me. I mean, you know, so this, what I'm saying is, is, not, you know, is not profound. Before, once 96 took place, there was no reason we couldn't certify Saddam. He had met the requirements of the various UN resolutions imposed on him to disarm. But, of course, it didn't happen because politically the Clinton administration didn't want it to happen. It would have been bad news. And then from 97 and 98 on, in, those, in that period before the, uh, Saddam finally tired of us, um, it, we were trying. Uh, the United States had infiltrated the United Nations uh, inspection process and was trying to assassinate uh, Saddam. The goal was to kill him. Dolfo was a party to this. Uh, Dolfo was a, a party to this as somebody who wanted, who supported this goal. Uh, Charlie Dolfo is a, sort of a nice, hapless guy. Uh, but the idea that his hands are clean in this, because much of the report, not only saying that, I, I read just the summary, uh, the summary sections of the report, not the whole one, but I read the summary sections carefully. Much of his report says, oh, he would have recon- if the sanctions had been lifted, he would have gone back to it. Even though if you read the report, even the summary carefully, he always says there was no capability. He's describing, and there, as you know, there's the president and the vice president both say this, the, the Dolphin report shows that he would have gone back to it if he could have. It's a little bit like the analogy be about Saddam being able to do it. Certainly Saddam would have wanted to, uh, but he couldn't do it. Just do it if, like me, you know, 20 years ago, I would have very much wanted to uh, um, have, a, have a fling with Sharon Stone, but I couldn't do it. I mean, it was that crazy, this kind of talk. There was no capability in the country to reconstitute anything. He'd been destroyed. But Dolford, nonetheless, in his report, along with the honest stuff he wrote, also gave these guys a chance to uh, gave them out. And that was very offensive to me. Look, I'm not surprised he did it. it, it he was uh, uh, approved by the White House. He went and did, he did the report. But the idea that the press doesn't tell you this is a guy with a history um, is very troubling because his report is being taken absolutely at face value, and, and on some elements it should not be. It's a political document. So much for the American press today, huh? Well, it's, it seems that uh, now the uh, Bush administration case rests entirely on intentions, you know, what <laughs> someone might have done. Are these people uh, equipped with ESP and they know in advance? Uh, well, it's, it's like I told you, you know, uh, uh, you know, well, I would have been happy to do Sharon Stone if she let me. But that's about the that's about the analogy for Saddam doing getting a weapon. He he may have wanted to, but there was no capability. And so there was just it's absolutely the report now, the. What the White House claimed now is Saddam would have if he could have, but the fact is he had no capability. If you read even the summary of the uh, Delphi report, 
He goes into what he it's believed he would have if he could have, but then they say there is no evidence that he had any capability. Look, in 1991, he, his nuclear capability was bombed to smithereens, whacked, bombed, gone. By 96, it was clear the U.N. people knew that very early. They were pretty sure that they got rid of most of the chemical weapons. By 96, the last doubt, there was a defection of one of his son-in-laws, a guy named uh, Kamal. Hussein Kamal, yeah. Yes, Hussein Kamal defects. And after that, Saddam kicks up the last of his inside papers, the papers about what he was doing about biologicals. They, they had gotten to his stuff, but they hadn't gotten all the paper. So by 96, not only had they destroyed his stuff, they'd gotten all of the paper, all of the research. There was a, there was a problem. Um, there was a discrepancy of, of, of 5,000 between the number of warheads Saddam was believed to have manufactured and the number that the UN, UN team found and destroyed. But they were pretty sure it was just a paper discrepancy and nothing we've heard since. There's only been about two dozen old warheads found. And in the DOFA report, he says that even if those weapons were did exist, they'd be unusable now because that stuff burns out after a few years. So there's no threat left. And yet, he writes this sort of uh, stuff that you know enables I, um, some people to write um, who want to believe that uh, the war was justified. Look, what can I tell you? The guy wasn't a threat, and if if um, uh, and the intel uh, the American intelligence stunk, and we really should be alarmed by that. That you know because it was very much top down. It was intelligence to please. If so much happens in America, there was a. Um dictator in Central Europe in, in the 1930s who said the great masses of people will more, more easily fall victims to a big lie than to a small one. Uh, is this an example, uh, Iraq, as an example of, of the triumph of propaganda? Well, you see, normally it'd be easy to say, yes, it's just a big lie. Bush knew it. But I'm telling you what really, look, if Bush had gone into Iraq for oil, you know what I'd say? Okay, because it was a crazy mission. It didn't work. He's still pursuing it, but at least the idea behind it was, you know, a cynical idea. We're going to grab the world's oil supply and keep us safe. That isn't what he did it for. He did it because of ideology, because he really believes the neoconservatives since 1991 – the Wolfowitzes and the uh, Richard Pearls have been advocating, we've got to take out Saddam. We've got to take out Saddam. That's the key to all the problems. And I think basically in those days they were talking about protecting Israel as much as anything else. But after 9-11, the mantra inside Mantra became that the, the way to get to, to peace in the world and protect not only our oil but Israel but all of us and to stop terrorism, the road to stopping terrorism led through Baghdad. And a crazy conceit, absolutely contradicted by everything on the inside. And yet Bush believes it. What I'm trying to tell you, sir, is if Bush is reelected, he's going to bomb, you know, the old canard about Vietnam is you had to bomb the country in order to save it. He's going to bomb the brains out of it. No matter how many body bags come back, he's going to continue to fight the war because he thinks it's his mission to install democracy. He thinks it's his God's will, whether it's a crusader, whether it's religious or whatever it is. You are not going to be able to stop this guy. There's a terrible joke going around in Boulder, Bush and Cheney, four more wars. Well, you know, I, I can't laugh about it anymore because I think these guys uh, really believe what they say. And when they say, would we do it the same way again, and no amount of body bags, they may have to do the draft. I don't know how they can keep the Army going. It's in terrible shape. We're going to, be, we're going to have a real epiphany if he's reelected. There are reports that Iran may be targeted by the Bush administration for no, an attack. Yeah, well, what are you going to bomb in Iran? Well, the, the reactors. Yeah, well, the reactors, first, we don't know where Iran, if they have the nuke, the International Atomic Energy Agency, I hate to break everybody's heart, says they don't know, and they're a pretty competent agency. It's easy to believe the worst. Iran certainly has been doing a lot of work and not telling the truth about it. Getting a bomb is a complicated thing and making sure it works. But they've taken everything underground and dispersed their works all over the country. And they filled on top of everything. They've loaded a lot of sand. And so, you know, a bunker buster isn't going to do it. You're going to have to, you know, go to something much stronger. And, you know, I'm not talking about tech nukes, but that's what you might have to do. You think that's going to happen? Uh-uh. What, yeah, it's been um, – the U.S. has been in hot pursuit of uh, Osama bin Laden for almost three years now. Why hasn't uh, he been captured? <laughs> well, e easy question. And where is he, according to your inside sources? 
Come on, come, come on, on Seymour. Come if on, I come knew, on. If I knew uh, why he had been captured and all that, you know, I tell you, if I knew that, why he had been captured and, you know, where is he, I'll tell you what I'd do. Uh, 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 <laughs> I think I'd spend my day at the racetrack, and, you know, if I could predict the future, I'd just, you know, clean up. The answer is I don't know. The best guess we have is that he is somewhere in the wilds of Waziristan and these, these are the Northwest Territories of Pakistan where nobody goes. That's the best guess. We do have a special, you know, we have a task force that's been in there. Uh, they've been in there for a long time. They've been told this summer, so my friends tell me, they, the two-star general in charge of it has been told, your next promotion depends on getting him, Saddam. I think they're in there looking hard. I don't think we're in Afghanistan looking for him. If you want to know the truth, I think we're inside Pakistan. But don't tell Musharraf that. He doesn't want to believe it. Uh, I don't think, I don't think there's a secret plot. I don't think he's been captured. I don't think we can get him. I think we would if we could. And the moment we got him, we would go public with him. I don't think there's going to be an October surprise. Uh, but I certainly don't know. I, you can't rule out anything. But I sort of think that's crazy. What's happening with the uh, Joe Wilson Va- Valerie Plame case? Um, briefly, Joe Wilson is a former U.S. diplomat who was sent uh, by the Bush administration to Niger to investigate the so-called yellow cake uranium story. Uh, then in July of '03, he wrote an op-ed in the New York Times saying that basically uh, the Bush administration misrepresented the entire Niger story. And then uh, shortly after that, is this cause and effect? Uh, Robert Novak outed his wife, Valerie Plame, as a CIA uh, agent. This is a federal crime. Uh, well, I, I'm, a lot of people do uh, uh, do think that there, there's a direct connection between Valerie uh, Valerie being uh, outed. Of course, the problem is the statute on which, you, when it is a federal crime to identify a, uh, a CIA official, the problem is you have to you have to have you have to show that the intent was to do so. In other words, you have to the person who's doing the outing has to know this person was undercover. So we're back to intentions again, like well, Iraq. I mean, it's a complicated statute, and uh, yeah, as you know, this case has led to a lot of reporters being subpoenaed. But I'll tell you what's interesting about the, the uh, this. Getting back to the Delfa report, in the Delfa report, he's very cryptic and clear that Niger, that whole thing was a, didn't work, and there was there was never any intention. Saddam didn't do it. But this summer, we had an, a Senate Intelligence Committee report that revived the story, uh, you know, led by uh, Pat Roberts, a Republican from Kansas. Oh, I think one of the worst reports ever written, by the way. But the Senate Intelligence Committee report uh, uh, revived the possibility that Niger did happen. So, in, And for a brief flurry, we had the Bill Sapphires of the world writing, uh, writing columns saying, now the president wasn't wrong, but this new report says he was. I can't answer your question about what's going to happen with the investigation. Uh, it's sad that the uh, assistant U.S. attorney, who's a very competent guy out of Chicago doing the investigation, he's supposed to be a very honorable guy. I'm a little surprised he's dragging all these reporters into it um, because that's that's going to lead to a constitutional conflict. Um, but it's certainly not going to be resolved before the election, so it's not going to have a bearing on whatever happens. How much money does the United States spend on intelligence every year? God, you're asking me a question I should know the answer to. I think it's $32 billion a year is the rough number for the CIA, the, the overall intelligence budget. $32 billion. That would buy you a lot of tickets at the Coney Island Ferris wheel. Uh, is why, it the Coney Island Ferris wheel? Yeah. Okay. Why, why then, if that's the case, the, did the Bush administration create their own uh, intelligence units uh, sort of operating offshore from uh, the main intelligence agencies? Well, you know, I write about this a lot, as you know. I'm talking about OSP and SAP. I write about this a lot in the book, I mean, because obviously they did it because they didn't like what they were hearing from the CIA. And so um, uh, they set up an own unit, you know, basically staffed by a leading neoconservative, a guy named Abraham Solsky, very bright but very, very neocon. And so uh, essentially uh, that's why they did it to get control of the process, because they didn't like what the CIA was saying. So they beat off the CIA intelligence with their own, and they were running the stuff directly into the president, called stovepiping, which is a very dangerous thing to do. And that's how Chalabi could be so important, Ahmed Chalabi, because he could run his, his crapola intelligence into the Pentagon without verifying it. I believe the line you, in your book is, the garbage was being shoved straight to the president. I think, as you know, I, I'm embarrassed to tell you, I don't remember that. <laughs> well, that's a direct quote. I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> All right. Well, we just have a few minutes left, uh, Seymour Hirsch. Um, I wonder if you could, you know, trace the kind of arc between uh, Me Lai and what happened there and the coverage of that that you did uh, to, you know, 35 years later to Abu Ghraib. 
Well, you know, there's a, it's interesting asking me about Milai, and, you know, 35 years later, I'll tell you, one of the things that happened is Milai stuck more. Obviously, American boys murdering people, but still, it's sort of amazing to me how Abu Ghraib, the Pentagon sort of had its way with it. They basically have tried to tell us that it's uh, seven bad seed, the seven soldiers reservists sewn in the pictures, those horrible photographs, and they're responsible, nobody else. And so far, those are the seven are being prosecuted. No officers have been charged with a crime yet. Some may be reprimanded, but none have been, um, which is really the thesis. One of the main theses of my book is that the responsibility goes higher. But more importantly, what's interesting to me is how around the world, um, Abu Ghraib has been as much as bad of a blow to our reputation as was Milai, even though Milai, as I said, involved a lot of deaths. I had an Israeli say something to me that was very telling. I got this buddy who's an old commando. This is a guy who knew Arabic and uh, knows Arabic and knows German and was crawling on his belly in the in the in the 50s in Damascus, you know, for the Mossad. Very tough Israeli. He said to me after I wrote I wrote a series of stories for the New Yorker magazine in this in the spring about it that led to um, a more reporting that's that that I read about in the book. But anyway, and he said to me after that stuff, he and I old pals and either I either call or email he said, you know, I hate Arabs, and I've been killing Arabs for 40 or 50 years, and they hate me, and they've been killing me. And, but i got to tell you, Hirsch, he said, at some time we're going to live with those SOBs, and we're going to share a border, whether there's a fence there or not. And if we had treated our Arab prisoners in our jails like you treated your American prisoners, your, I mean, your, Ira- your, yeah, your Iraqi prisoners, he said, your Arab prisoners, we couldn't share a border with them. That's how much trouble you're in. And I don't think we really appreciate how much the Arab world is turned off. I'm talking about our friends. They're really horrified. We've dug a big hole for ourselves with Abu Ghraib. And in a way, it is very important because the Arab world, we've lost any vestige of morality, we claim. And we're a country that came through World War II believing we were a moral country and even fighting the communists. That was always a moral battle for us. And now we've lost so much of it. And not only with uh, the Arab world, but with our friends in Europe and our friends in the, in the Far East, we're in real trouble. And we've got to figure out some way to restore our, our, our sense of morality and integrity. And um, uh, I don't know if uh, I, we certainly can't do it with Bush. I hope we can do it with Kerry if he's elected. Well, there was also, a, it seems, a similarity uh, from what I read uh, Melvin Laird's comments uh, in uh, right around Milai. He was Nixon's defense secretary. And uh, uh, Cheney and Rumsfeld's comments today about no resignations, we're going to hunker down, damage control. That's what I meant about that arc connecting the two events. Um, yeah, well, you know, um, um, uh, absolutely. And the, the, the important thing about Cheney's call and, and uh, hunkering down is he what, what is what he didn't say. He didn't call Rumsfeld. I write about this at the end of the book. He didn't call and say, what's going on there, Don? These photographs, what kind of stuff are you doing there? What kind of prison is this? I want to report. He calls and says, "No resignations. Let's 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 cover this up." Anyway, I gotta go. Okay. Well, uh, listen, it's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you so much. And good luck with uh, your book, Chain of Command. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Bye-bye. Si. Bye bye. And I've been talking to Seymour Hirsch, uh, Pulitzer Prize winner, feature writer for The New Yorker. His latest book is Chain of Command: The Road from 9/11 to Abu Ghraib. I'm David Barsamian. Thank you for listening.